So my understanding is a Salafiya, the religion of Islam, the way the companions understood the Quran and the Sunnah and taking it out there and practicing mm -hmm. that. Not sitting in the office or the masjid being theoretic about the names and the attributes of Allah, although important. Mm -hmm. I don't understand Salafi is sitting in my masjid and I'm saying, I don't like Dr. Salman, but because he had this person on his broadcast mm -hmm. and he had that one and he, that's not my understanding. My understanding of Salafiyyah is mm -hmm. making things right on all levels that you find yourself in as a Muslim and to give as much benefit to the people as you can as the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The best of you are those who bring most benefit to others. So here at Green Lane, I'm really impressed with all of what they do. Asalaamu As Alaikum Legends, we're in probably the most pious place we've ever done a podcast before. It's none other than the Green Lane Masjid in Birmingham Sharif. Uh, we're sitting with Sheikh Abu Asama al Dahbi. it's been a long time overdue, and it was an amazing podcast, we got a lot to look forward to, inshallah. We talk about social ills, we talk about racism, we talk about gang and uh, violence, we talk about Abu Osama himself, uh, his upbringing, his journey to knowledge and so forth and a lot of good advice he would give to his younger self and the younger du'at and uh, imams coming out from the different universities and so forth now today. So just before we begin, just a reminder, please do click on the subscribe button below, hit the bell notification. Let's try and get 500 people to do that with this video, inshallah, because we've noticed that not many people have subscribed, many people are watching. So secondly, please do remember to donate. Let's try and get 250 people from this video to donate five pounds a month. It's not much, it's only 16 odd pence a day, I think. Uh, but you can do it, I believe. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to today's special in unscripted episode. We've come to a very special place, it's Green Lane Masjid in Birmingham Sharif, and we have a very special guest, the Imam here, Sheikh Abu Osama al Dhabi. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. My brother Salman, but Dr. Salman. How are you doing, Sheikh? Great, great Salman. It's been a while. We want, wanted to come and visit you. Alhamdulillah. I hope everything's doing well here. Everything runs in a lot yeah. of time, but I want to say this. I'm really um, happy that you're here and we welcome you to our masjid here at Green Lane. You and your crew. Assalamualaikum. <laughs> We have received a very gracious Birmingham welcome, alhamdulillah. <laughs> Although it's quite early, quite early, yeah. mashallah. <laughs> mashallah. Uh, this is the first time I've, uh, I think I've seen you since the passing away of Sheikh Ali Al-Halabi, rahimahullah. So my condolences. I know he was your uh, an influential Sheikh and teacher. And uh, maybe, you know, um, if you want to mention a few things about how he affected you, impacted you first. I mean, we want to get to know the real Sheikh Abu Sama al-Dhahabi and it sounds like he was um, an influential figure in your life. Well, I no Allah. doubt that Sheikh uh, Abu al-Harith rahmatullahi alayhi was a tremendous um, personality mm -hmm. um, and individual. Um, as I mentioned before, I've dealt with the passing away of close relatives. My grandmother mm -hmm. on both sides, grandfather on both sides, aunties, aunts, aunties and uncles on both sides, my brother. But I was kind of young at that time, or I wasn't in America to deal with going to the funeral. Whereas with mm. Sheikh Ali, it was the first time I had to deal with an adult who died that was very close to me. So it was quite uh, an experience. Mm. And I didn't expect you to open up with this particular question. So I kind of like, you know, you, you, mm. you shook me a little bit. But one of the things that I try to do, Dr. B, is I try to... Uh, um, give dawah to the community, especially our shabab, about being uh, balanced. Mm. Sheikh Ali al-Halabi, for all of the love that I have for him, for all of what I perceive uh, uh, in terms of the good that he gave to mm -hmm. the dawah in the UK, in America, in the West, and other places, for all of mm. the uh, positive ideas, feelings that I have about him, that good opinion, he is not Allah, and he's not Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Life mm. continues to go. And mm. we learned that with the death of Ibrahim, the son of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We cry, we become sad, but we mm. only say that which is pleasing to Allah. And we just mm. keep it moving. But uh, um, I appreciate you did mention him because mm. I feel that he's done so much good for me personally and dawah here in the West and across the globe 
that it is really not just rhetoric when I say that the Ummah of Islam has lost an integral, very important part of our academic ability because Sheikh was on mm -hmm. another level academically mm -hmm. and knowledge-wise. Rahmatullah wa rahmatim wasi'ah. And I want to have to say this as well. You know, some of our brothers in different groups, jama'at, we go overboard in our personalities. This is a problem. So mm. we'll hear someone mention, say, Qutb, for an example, Hassan al-Banna, for an example. And we say, mm -hmm. Rahimahumullah. Mm -hmm. But we don't say the shaheed because that guarantees that individual has a place in Jannah. We don't know if a person is shaheed, not shaheed. Mm -hmm. So I want to exemplify and show that same thing with the passing of Sheikh Ali. We can't have double standards. Mm. Al-Islam continues to go. Al-Islam continues to move forward, mm -hmm. with or without Sheikh Ali al-Halabi. I remember Dr. Salman when um, Michael Jackson was on the scene and he was using the Nation of Islam as security in the famous trial that he had. The mm. Nation of Islam are not even Muslims. But anyway, point was, Muslims were saying in the Arab world, Michael Jackson has become a Muslim. Michael, Michael uh, Jackson yeah, become a Muslim. I remember that. And then people went a step further. So he's going to be with the Mu'adhin. <laughs> that comes as a result, I believe, right. colonization. Colonization in the mm. mind and colonization of our lands. Where we become so inferior in our complexes that mm. we think we need the likes of Michael Jackson to be the Mu'adhin. But if we looked at the books of fiqh of al-Islam, we would say, no, that's not going to happen if the Muslims were practicing religion because yeah. the scholars of Islam had this issue, this mas'ala, who is getting more reward, the mu'adhin or the imam? imam. Mm. And they said that the mu'adhin, although some people said the imam. So my point is superiority complexes, inferiority complexes are a problem. Mm. So you mentioned, uh, you just alluded to you that you were born and raised in the USA. Um, tell us more about your upbringing, if you if you don't mind, you know, so we can get to know who. Because we've heard things here and there. Um, we've been in the Dallas scene a long time, mashallah. We've heard you. Uh, yeah, I was born in America on the yeah. East Coast in New Jersey uh, to uh, Mamie Starr and my dad, yeah. Thomas Lee Lipscomb. Uh, two loving parents came from the South. Uh, their parents migrated to the north looking for a better job opportunities as many African-American um, mm. people did back in the uh, 50s, 60s, and even the 70s. And I uh, was in school there, and I had uh, to deal with a lot of issues. I don't want to get into all of that, <laughs> but I didn't have the easiest life. But mm. alhamdulillah, for the rahmah that Allah gave me two parents who were loving nurturing, mm. supportive, and uh, to this day, alhamdulillah, they have a lot of respect for El Islam, respect for me, and I also love and respect all of the efforts that they made for me mm. while I was trying to navigate through the uh, nonsense of what we had to deal with in the community that I came from. I accepted El Islam in 1986, alhamdulillah, mm. and immediately went to Medina where I started to study the religion and I stayed mm. for uh, eight years. What made you want to go to Medina in the first place? Um, that's a big, big step, I would imagine. I think it, the main thing was uh, in my community, I saw Muslims. I saw mm. Muslims who were from Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Palestine, Jordanians. Mm. And um, they were doing the usual things that we find in the inner city in America, in the big cities, New York and so forth and so on, Newark, New Jersey. They um, had... Um, Stores where they were selling pork, uh, hummer, alcohol, things mm -hmm. like that. So when I became a Muslim and I started to tell these people, as I've always been passionate about mm -hmm. being African American, when I accepted Islam, I didn't believe I had to speak with an accent as if I was uh, Pakistani and Arab, because some of the older people, that's what I saw from them. Really? Yeah, mm -hmm. they thought that being a Muslim was synonymous with uh, changing your culture and taking the culture on of other people. And I was rejecting that right out. But a lot of people say that in the U.S., um, Islam, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved Islam through African Americans for a long period of time in terms of it was it was maybe because of nation Islam, maybe because of key individuals in the, uh, Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X, rahimahumullah. But Islam was seen as something kind of American already before the immigrants came, wasn't it? As for 
Allah preserved Al Islam with African Americans. I don't know. I guess how you look at it um, mm. is going to determine where you stand on the spectrum. Mm. I think that African American Muslims definitely had something to do with the preservation of Al Islam. As for the nation of Islam, yeah. the Marish Science Temple, and the people who are claiming to be Muslims but they're not Muslims, then how can mm -hmm. Islam be preserved by people who are not even Muslims? That's yeah, like yeah. the academia right now. People studying in Yale and Harvard and these big universities, they're going to teach you and me proper Islam? No, they're going to mm -hmm. teach some Islam and there's benefit in that, but we're not going to change that with the classic you know, um, the man, yeah. reality. So. For me, back then, when I saw many of our immigrant brothers mm. believing it was okay to uh, lower the standard as it relates to their responsibility in the African-American non-Muslim community by selling pork and all that poison, I used to talk to them, and they used to argue with me. They used to argue with me, and I didn't have knowledge to argue back. That's one reason that, mm. you know, inspired me to go to Medina. And another thing is I became Muslim with a group of African-American people who I knew, although they meant good and they wanted to do good, they didn't have knowledge as well. And I'm a brand spanking new Muslim. Mm -hmm. And I realized I was just at the mercy of all of the Muslims. <laughs> I was like a piece of wind, a piece of paper flowing in the wind, just floating wherever the wind blew me. I mean, do I to a lot of, please, please, Mm. open up a way where I can learn my religion so I can discern for myself how I'm going to be upon this journey, Dr. Sun Man. Yeah. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And click that donate button too. MashaAllah. So you went to Medina. I spent eight years there. Uh, at what point did you come to... How did you end up in Birmingham? <laughs> uh, after going to Medina and graduating from Medina, I had my family in El Medina, and it was time to come back. Um, when we came back to America, I went uh, to my mother's place, and then I mm. went to Florida, Orlando, Florida, where we started a community called Al Istiqama. To this very day, that is still one of the communities that uh, very close to my heart. I can sit here and begin to name the brothers from that community, Abu Jibril and uh, my man Rashid and uh, just Dawood al-Haddad and, uh, and Tajuddin and all of those brothers. We're going to have a reunion soon, inshallah, where we'll all hook up in Florida. But uh, um, while I was there, an opportunity came to come to the UK because at that time things were going on in America. I just didn't trust George Bush, to be honest with you. Uh, the World Trade Center had happened, mm. and uh, they were suspending people's human rights, their civil liberties, like they did to this brother. Um, he's been on your program before. He's from Birmingham. Muazzam Muazzam Beg. Beg, yeah. Yeah. yeah, They just oppress people. Uh, Ali Tamimi, they just yeah. grab people, lock you up. I may not necessarily agree with a person's uh, way of seeing things, but no, mm. way, no, no way in the world am I in agreement with someone being oppressed so Absolutely. that thing was happening mm. in America. So I said, okay, I'm going to get out of here. And I came to the UK. And actually, I went to Luton first. That was the first community I went to when I was mm. in the UK, Luton. But Hizbut Tahrir were very active in Luton. They were doing a lot of things. And I wasn't trying to be above <laughs> the radar like that. They were doing mm. a lot of things that I felt were a bit uh, unacceptable. And then I wound up so going to So this is freshly after 9-11, basically. Kind of, not yeah. fret, yeah, yeah, kind of after 9-11, yeah, yeah okay. kind of. That, that was the genesis that started to trigger all mm. of the uh, things that were going on in America that made me very, yeah. very um, uncomfortable with the way George Bush was going to uh, mm. act because I know I'm not an extremist. I know that I'm not radical, but I know that the dollar that I gave, I'm going to call the American government out for their double standards, for their racism, for what's going on with my people, for mm -hmm. the uh, police, police brutality, the systemic racism. Mm -hmm. And they will accept me being a voice telling the Muslim youth, this stuff about ISIS and this extremism is not our religion. The government accept that. But then when you start seeing the other things, you yeah. guys are, you know, <laughs> yeah. hypocritical and you're on double standards, this is when you have a problem. So. That's how power operates. That's yes, how it I mean, goes, You mentioned brother. colonialism. You mentioned it's all part of the same kind of discourse, really, of, of 
um, utilizing the Muslims to, you know, speak your message, but don't don't criticize us. Okay. And it's unfair, brother. Yeah. And I'm here to say that right now, mm. out publicly. There are people who are making efforts to educate our community about the correct understanding of Islam without any apologies. Mm. Not talking out of the side of our necks for anyone about our religion. Mm. And then when the powers to be hear something that they don't deem is along the lines of their narrative, mm. they come and they want to chop the legs from under the people who are being true mm. and authentic to the reality of our religion. And we, really, our religion is not a religion, as you know, that's calling to indiscriminately hurt people. But we are calling for human rights. Mm. And we as Muslims have to be on the right side of the fence of that argument. And uh, mm. we let the trips fall where they may. Mm. Alhamdulillah. So um, this is one thing I ask um, all the OGs that we have on the podcast, uh, not to call you old or anything, uh, but what advice would you give to your younger self? If you, if you had to, uh, let's say, rewind 20 years, you got, you, got, uh, you got a phone call from a 20-year-old Abu Osama Dhabi, you know, what would you say to him? I think it's really important, uh, Dr. Sunman, for young people to have a level of humility mm. and the ability to listen to what people who have tread the path have gained in the way of experience and knowledge. So when they turn back and they try to talk to you, you should disengage mm. and relax and listen because you don't have to reinvent the will. <clears throat> So if it's a I, natural, natural thing in life, you know. <laughs> yeah, man. I read uh, a really nice quote that uh, the moment you realize your father was right, you've got a son telling you you're wrong. That's it, brother. <laughs> that's it. Smiling. Because right now in dealing with my own children, and that's what I processed yeah. when you asked me the question. I'm dealing with my own children. I'm trying to tell my sons especially, hey, I know what time it is. You see this watch? I'm not talking about the time of the watch. I know what time it is out there in the streets and in the world. Mm -hmm. I've been around the block. Not only was I around the block, I used to kind of own the block. So I try to tell my <laughs> sons, don't think I'm Frank Sausage Head and I don't know what time it is. But no matter what I say, they kind of think you're old school because you don't know about algorithms. <laughs> So I just think young people need to just pump their brakes and slow down. Because although I don't know about algorithm, algorithms, algorithms are quite old as well. I know what time it is, you know. So if I were to give advice to a young version of Abu Sama, I would say just that. Relax, pump your brakes, take it easy. You don't have all of the answers. There are people out here who have tread this path before you listen, learn, and uh, comprehend. Mm -hmm. Is that the same advice you give to young kind of graduates, young Talab Ilm that come out of the uh, universities and stuff and take the positions as imams and stuff? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say, you know, with the younger brothers learning in uh, the different Islamic universities uh, across the globe, I have a good relationship with the vast majority mm -hmm. of them. Uh, only one from amongst them who's getting his master's, I think he received his master's, he's the most complicated and difficult personality that I ever met in Dawa, so we're going to put him on the side. <laughs> but with the other brothers, with the other brothers, um, I'm really impressed with the Noria, you know, the type of brothers we have coming up. Some of them, yeah, very young, pumped up, ready to go out there, refute, do this, do that. It's just it's a learning curve. And we mm. just have to pull those brothers in and breathe on them and say, yes, refuting is all from our religion. And we're going to refute when we should refute, how we should refute, and the person who needs to be refuted, looking at all of mm. the dynamics of the situation. So, yeah, that's mm. one of my advices to the brothers, to mm. take it easy and to slow down. And that message usually Dr. B resonates with uh, those brothers, mashallah. Mashallah, mashallah. Um, so... We're in Green Lane Masjid, and Green Lane Masjid is, you know, uh, well known for doing lots of community projects that perhaps um, a lot of other masajid might not, 
you know, uh, engage in uh, other than the the core masjid activities, you know, the prayers, the Jum'a, the, the madrasa, and so forth. They have issues where they have programs where they, mashallah, um, uh, engage with the community, try and uh, address some common social ills. Uh, the brother he was showing me around. Uh, Brother Kam- Kamran, mashallah, he was saying, you know, they're even opening up a domestic violence kind of bureau soon, mashallah. So, um, is that something that attracted you to Greenland? Is that something you uh, you feel is important for the Imams, for Tullah Ilm to get involved in? Uh, or is this something that, you know, you find yourself, my area is here, and mashallah, the different projects are happening, and, but this is my area here? Absolutely, Dr. B. Um, I'm, I'm thoroughly impressed with the platform that Green Lane has created for itself. The ideal case scenario for me, doctor, would be to go back to America, mm-hmm. to be in a community like Green Lane, to address the issues of the African-American community. Mm-hmm. My people, like the prophets and the messengers, used to come in the Quran and they used to say, Ya qawmi ibudullah. I want to go to my people, African-Americans, mm-hmm. to help them in their situation. So I'm working towards that. Inshallah, when it happens, it happens. But until that time, in the meantime, in between time, I'm here in Green Lane. And one of the things that I love about Green Lane is that when I started working with Green Lane from Keithley, I was living in Keithley Mm -hmm. in West Yorkshire, where the Yorkshire Ripper was, (laughs) where sheep and cows outnumber the people. I was the only black in the community, so to speak, when I used to walk (laughs) around. But I had good relationships. The the BNP are up there. Wow. But I love that place. It's home for me. <laughs> My community were mere poories. Yeah. Every time I went home from a dawah trip, came back to the country, and I was driving from Bradford to yeah. Keithley, I said, I'm home. Mashallah. To this day, I still love those people. While I was there, the brothers from Green Lane invited me. I started doing a class every Tuesday, and that's when I was exposed to what was going on in mm. Green Lane. And year after year, they had vision, and they just continued to do better and get better and better. Until Absolutely. now, they are dealing with and addressing issues locally, nationally, internationally, globally. Mm. So in two, three more days, we're about to go to Lebanon, inshallah, to distribute Absolutely. some uh, winterization for our Muslim brothers who are affected by what's going on in Syria. Mm. They deal with the Syrians, with refugees in Lebanon, Pakistan, uh, Pakistan, Palestine, Kashmir, mm. Yemen. So my understanding is a Salafiya, the religion of Islam, the way the companions understood the Quran and the Sunnah and taking it out there and practicing mm. that. Not sitting in the office or the masjid being theoretic about the names and the attributes of Allah, although important. Mm. I don't understand Salafi is sitting in my masjid and I'm saying, I don't like Dr. Salman, but because he had this person on his broadcast mm. and he had that one and he... That's not my understanding. My understanding of Salafiyya is mm. making things right on all levels that you find yourself in as a Muslim mm. and to give as much benefit to the people as you can as the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The best of you are those who bring most benefit to others. So here, Green Lane, I'm really impressed with all of what they do. And mm. I would like to mention this, uh, Dr. Sanman, because you're kind of connected to it as well. While working and cooperating with Green Lane, giving a khutbah once a month sometimes mm-hmm. in my class every Thursday and just being with these brothers and going to uh, uh, Lebanon and to Syria, while working with them, I came to get to know a young brother. I used to see this young brother around as he was growing up. I thought he was kind of weird, to be honest with you. I would give him salams. I didn't even know if he returned the salams. Mm. He always had this weird posture, demeanor, this thing about him, his name is Humayun. And then on this upcoming trip, I got to meet him and we started talking and we started to get to know each other. And I realized, mm. you know, wow, I pegged this young man very wrong. You know, when you meet someone, they may not be, their reality is not what you thought it was. Turns out that this young man has a degree in nuclear physics. <laughs> and anytime I hear that, sounds dangerous. Yeah, it blows. <laughs> It blows my head. It blows my mind. Like yeah. when I asked you, doctor, your, 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 your degree is in what? And you told me you're a biochemist. Yeah. 
You know, as an African American who didn't have opportunities to excel academically, when I hear that kind of mm. stuff, on one hand, it makes me like, wow, blown away and proud of you. I'm not a hater. I support mm. that. But on the other hand, I say subhanAllah, if, and I don't mean the if that's haram, mm. but if we as African Americans have been put in positions like that and opportunities yeah. like that, it would have been easy for a lot mm. of us to get degrees and so forth and so on. But the deck is stacked against us. And this is one of the reasons, Absolutely. again, to bring it back to Green Lane. Mm. I'm in the business, in the dawah of trying to help the Muslims. Where I can cooperate with people, I will cooperate. Main mm. reason I came on this platform today is that your platform reaches a lot of the youth in our community. So I wanted my voice to be heard. Mm. I wanted my voice to be heard as it relates to that. Because we're just trying to help Islam and help the Muslims to move forward, brother. Mm. Do you get some resistance from some people? I mean, you mentioned Salafia, how your vision for Salafia uh, in today's day and age is not just kind of the theoretical, but being practical, being out there, helping the community, uh, in being involved in activism, perhaps you might say, uh, engaging with the, the local you know, uh, community, politicians maybe. Some people might say, no, you're supposed to focus on Tawheed, you know, this business of politics and other stuff comes later. What do you say to those types of people? Yeah, we get, um, I personally have gotten a lot of criticism from brothers over the years, but um, I tend not to pay attention to people who detract just for the mm -hmm. sake of detracting mm -hmm. or people who are negative because of their understanding of the issue as I perceive it is warped. I am not going to sit back and let someone tell me and superimpose on me the understanding of the religion when it, it is clearly not going in accordance to what I understand. For an example, yeah. we've had this phenomenon like Sheikh Ali al Hadibi, where a group of people are insisting you're outside of the Sunnah, he's off of the Sunnah, he's out of the Sunnah, but they do it without wisdom, they do it without knowledge. Mm -hmm. What fundamental, what asl of the asul of the Sunnah did the brother go against? for him to be expelled. So when I see people who are just, you know, playing games like that, that really yeah. doesn't uh, affect me and doesn't slow me down. The Arabs say, Al tamdi wal kilabu tanbahu. The caravan with the, with the, with the um, camels in it, you have a caravan of 30, 40 camels, they're going, and the dogs come in the desert and they start barking, start barking at the caravan. Not a single camel is going to start <laughs> to stop and say, hey, dog, you, what's the deal? You just got to let him go. Keep it moving. Hey, mm. hey, hey, you do your thing and I'm not paying attention to you. Mm. So the people who want to criticize and that's all they do is mm. criticize, I personally don't have time for that. So basically, doctor, the point that I was trying to make and I would like to make from this, and many points can be drawn from it and mm. lessons, is that brothers like you, with the highly technical degree that you have, brothers like Humayun with a degree in our, um, nuclear physics, and still you find yourself trying to do work for Islam, like having these podcasts and doing all of the many things that you do in the background people don't know about. That brother spending his time in Green Lane Masjid trying to organize getting you know, winterization to Muslims across the globe. Awesome. I would just like to encourage all of the younger Muslims and brothers, the brothers and sisters to understand wherever you find yourself, your degree, your profession, whatever you do, you have to find some majab, some opportunity where mm -hmm. you're going to give da'wah to Allah to help the religion. That's the point that I wanted to make. Enjoying this podcast? Remember to click subscribe, like, comment below and donate to support Islam to see make more of this kind of stuff. It's very important especially because a lot of a lot of uh, talent from the Muslim community gets kind of uh, whipped up from finance, financial services, uh, you know, banks and uh, <laughs> large corporations and stuff. And this is a fact. And yeah. We have a large pool and a lot of talent out there in our community. Mm. It's a responsibility of the leadership. And leadership doesn't only mean imams and so forth. So on. It's the people running the masjid. It's those people mm. who are, you know, in the field of academia. It's the responsibility of the Muslim leadership to uh, expose these talented uh, young mm. people and to get behind them, mentor them, keep them uh, moving forward, inshallah. Yeah, and, and also kind of the bridging that entertain, uh, uh, attainment gap, the educational attainment gap as well, helping 
communities that have been historically systemically disadvantaged. You mentioned African Americans, for example, in the U.S. and over here, no doubt, there's many, many uh, kind of uh, systemically disadvantaged communities. That that's something we need to to work towards as well. No doubt. Yeah. So on a personal level, I just want to let you know, brother yeah. to brother, I'm uh, super proud of your accomplishments <laughs> academically, <laughs> brother. Keep <laughs> up <laughs> the good work, doctor. Barak <laughs> uh, So you. We talked about Greenland Masjid and mashallah, it's it's kind of um, uh, sad to say uniqueness. Uh, even the more mas massages should be doing uh, something similar, in that it kind of um, uh, works with the community on many different uh, social issues uh, and, and and outreach projects and so forth. What would you say are the kind of um, most concerning or the kind of uh, most common social ills? Um, in the wider community that you, you feel that uh, we should be thinking about? I think about. the demographics of Small Heath, where Green Lane is located, and with Birmingham being the second largest city in this country, and the dynamics that that brings to the table, and that a lot of the first generation, second generation uh, Muslims who came from overseas mm -hmm. settled here in Birmingham, we have a lot of antisocial behavior, knife crime, gang crime, we have uh, drugs, mm -hmm. and, and all of those issues are issues that Green Lane is trying to tackle in one shape, form, or fashion or another. Mm -hmm. I was Lane, surprised to see a knife bank yeah, just knife around bank. the corner. It used to be really, old. really um, like um, hot, and there was a big mm. push for it, but with COVID, things have slowed down, but uh, we felt... It was the, the, the administration in Green Lane felt, people mm -hmm. who are running the program felt, we have to have our feet on the ground to address the issues mm -hmm. that are, you know, um, our community are, have to confront. So the knife crime issue, the uh, anti-social behavior we see from many of the Muslims here, the gang culture, we had quite mm -hmm. a few Muslims uh, murdered at the hands of it's other fun. Muslims. Fun. So we have to do something about that. We have uh, this issue of uh, single parent homes. In most instances, it's the mother who's raising mm. a child by herself. So we've come up with uh, different uh, initiatives where children who are having different problems adjusting in school, in society, they come to the mm. masjid with children similar to them and we give them a mentor who understands what they're going through just to uh, make the kids feel like uh, they have someone or some people mm. who are there to support them. So this is the thing that I love about this masjid, Salman, this whole thing about us going out and just addressing the different challenges in our community. I got, used to be the imam mm. uh, for the last four years in Liverpool and Masjid al-Rahma, which is the biggest masjid there. I love that city, it was a nice mm -hmm. opportunity. But we had some segments of the community who were insisting that the khutbah is in Arabic. We had some segments of the community who were insisting that we run things as if we're back in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And what part of the Middle East? The poorest country in the Middle East. I can say if you wanted to <laughs> replicate one of the rich countries in the Middle East where there's infrastructure, okay, but they want us to replicate the poorest, most mm. broken down structure in the Middle East because that's where they come from. And we had a lot of things to do, but we had to waste a lot of time fighting yeah. and clashing with this mentality. We are no longer in our countries where we come from, and we are not second-class mm. citizens. We have to exercise our rights and be proud to be Muslims and uh, citizens of this country. And they've given us rights that are, um, if we call them out on them, they'll give us our rights, inshallah. Do you think uh, it's because of a more deep-seated crisis of identity that they want to hold on to these things? or I think it's a plethora of things, and I think that's one mm. of the dynamics. I also believe it's a, um, it has a lot to do with uh, education or lack mm. thereof. When you come from a country where people did not put a lot of emphasis on education, when you get an opportunity, take advantage of education, mm. you squander the opportunity. I would think without knowing anything about your parents that they had a lot to do with pushing you until you got that degree, supporting you and creating an, an environment for you to mm. get your degree. So if someone comes into a situation where they don't 
look at it and they don't conceive the mm. importance of the, the the situation nothing's going to happen mm. so talk, talking about okay going back to knife crime gang violence how do you as an imam how do you begin to address that issue i think it has a lot to do with uh, knowing that lifestyle mm. coming from that lifestyle so there's a level of understanding and a level of empathy yes mm. and also some um I don't know, I don't want to call it NC Jam, but uh, um, I think those kids know and they can recognize people who can relate to their situation. A lot of times their families can't relate to what they're dealing with, mm. so the parents don't know how to address it because they just can't relate to what the kids are being exposed to. In my case, this was part and parcel of the upbringing that I was exposed to, the environment that I came up in. So when I connect with those kids, the language, the uh, ideas, I understand that, but being able to relate to them from the religious perspective and give them the understand that, hey man, Islam mm. holds you to a higher standard than this. And uh, all we can do is understand it's our job just to give advice and just mm. to try to help. It's not my responsibility to change people. And if I go into it, like that's gonna be a problem. So I'm just here to mm. support to help to understand and not to judge and not to judge I'm just here to help mm. to support to understand to do my best inshallah I mean whenever I speak to someone who's involved in tackling these types of issues I always get the impression that particularly for example gang life I always get the impression that the 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 gang is just a kind of modern um, replacement for the tribe because the tribe was broken up society was atomized People were, that were once in large clans and large extent, what we today call extended families, have been chopped up to this single unit, and often there's there's, there's uh, it's lacking. You know, there might be the single unit, the nuclear family is very new, the husband, wife, and two point whatever kids, and now if the husband's not there, if the father's not there, if he's dead or if he's away or whatever, where does that where does that that camaraderie come from? And it has to come from. A broader thing and I think in order to tackle this problem effectively we need to take into account that need for the mentors that need for the brotherhood that need for one of the the, the estates where I grew up where, what they did was it wasn't like a conscious thing I'm, I'm, I'm sh I, I don't know but people from a particular estate would be embarrassed or shy to do certain things because they know elder people in that estate nearby and I thought this is a kind of socially this is what keeps people in check it's not the law the hard arm of the law it's the more it's more the the, the being ashamed of doing something wrong doing something bad you know and that sense of shame is a very important tool I think for a successful society Professor Salam you know, famously said if you uh, if you don't have any shame then fasna'a ma shittum yeah, do as you like. And uh, the way you talk, it sounds like you have some experience uh, either on the ground or theoretically about how we're trying to address mm -hmm. the issue. And no doubt, Allah created us nations and tribes so that we can get to know each other. And there's nothing wrong with that. So in the study of mm -hmm. uh, societies and sociology, this point is a critical point. So people come up in the inner city, people come mm -hmm. up without the support of the extended family, the Kabila, the tribe, there are gonna mm -hmm. be some problems and there's nothing wrong with that. The fact that uh, we have clusters of people with adat and taqalid, norms, mores that are, you know, they mm -hmm. define them. So a lot of these kids, there's a disconnect. So they're looking for a father. Mm -hmm. They're looking for an accept, uh, acceptance. And then we find that they're willing to do these uh, mad, you know, actions of mayhem mm. in order to please the people who they've taken as, you know, their new support group. Mm. And this is really important, Dr. Selman, because you drew from what happened at the estate. And for the American people who are listening, the estate is like... Uh, the hood. Yeah, like <laughs> the projects or something. That's the estate. Mm. If the American person says, listens to a state, they think it's... <laughs> No, the state is not yes. like that. Where I go <laughs> when I'm not watching the races. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. But uh, um, we are, um, we just think that it's important. Mm. I have to make this point. 
uh, in the masjid, if we're going to make the masjid very cultural, where we bring an imam sahab from the country where we come from, we originate from, mm -hmm. he doesn't speak English, he doesn't know the culture, he can't relate to this kid, then we as Muslims, as communities, we're shooting ourselves in the foot, so to speak. Mm -hmm. We have to get imams who can understand the reality mm -hmm. of what we're living right here. And that means he's going to be balanced, he's going to be knowledgeable, and he's not going to be a person mm -hmm. who is apologetic, and he can give a khutbah and instruction to the community that you know, we can use. That mm -hmm. is the day that we're living in right now. We're not living mm -hmm. in those days where we just bring someone and offer him peanuts as a salary, and we bring him from the old school, from the old country, and he can't relate to any of us. Yeah. I, as an African-American here in the UK, I want to go into a mischief, talk to the imam that I can relate to. I don't want to go into a masjid and the imam looks at me as if, you know, he can see right through me and I can't even begin to communicate with him. Mm. So these are some of the new age responsibilities that our community, we have yeah. in moving forward. So on, on, on the topic of social ills then, do you think, um, do you think racism is something, uh, what's your experience of racism amongst the Muslim community? I mean, we had this, uh, it, you know, it, it was briefly on our news radar with the with the, the killing of the murder of George Floyd, for example. The BLM Black Lives Matter was as a as a slogan. It was, you know, it was uh, dominating our news agenda, and people were forced to uh, get to grips with and 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 talk about anti-black racism. Um, what's been your experience? Do you think that's something that is? is what's the trajectory? Is it going up? Is it down? Going down? Well, also? first I can say it's never going to go down. At least right now, it's not going down. And what they are catching uh, in the way of um, people filming these incidents, that's just. You know, tiny, the tip tiny, of the iceberg. Yeah. Uh, as I sit before you, these teeth that are missing in my head came, this incident came as a result of police brutality. Had nothing oh, to no. do with me. And this is just what you can see. It's the tip of the iceberg. When they try to destroy my kidney and my liver by beating me in my back, that, you can't see that. So for me, I believe that uh, Black Lives Matter not hashtag Black Lives Matter. I don't buy into the ethos and the mandate of that group, but Black Lives do matter. I take that to a degree as well, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Salman, but observing Corona, do you believe in Corona? Because I met some Muslims who <laughs> say, no, there's no Corona, you know, conspiracy theorists. They say, no. Mm -hmm. But in dealing with Corona, and I wear my mask outside, I only wear a black mask. Mashallah. Black Lives Matter, meaning what? I want the world to be sensitive to mm. the police brutality that we have to deal with. I'm going to be going back to America soon, inshallah, to Queens, New mm. York, bi'idhnillah, then go see my mother, bi'idhnillah. Every time I go back there, I have to mentally prepare myself for what can happen. It's a real thing. It's not something, a figment of my imagination. And now, I'm you, like, now you've got a double issue, Muslim and black. Exactly. Two strikes <laughs> against you. And that's mm. my understanding of, yes, black lives mm. matter. When I go to court, I'm a Muslim. When I go to court, I'm African American. Mm. So before the judge even comes in and the man says, all rise, I got two strikes against me. Now when they say all rise, I say, well, I'm not standing up for the judge because, you know, in our religion, we don't stand up for people. So I got three strikes against me already. And we didn't even begin the process yet. Mm. So as a Muslim, that goes to show me I have to be on top of my religion, knowledge-wise, and I have to deal with the reality on the ground. Mm. Not some book that I read, Sheikh Islam ibn Taymiyyah said this, said that, and that's all beautiful, but how does that kalam translate to me getting on with my life and navigating through all of these uh, minefields that are mm. in front of me? So... So it, it's a challenge, brother. So as it relates to the racism in America, America was built upon racism. It is built on racism. Mm -hmm. So for me, when it comes to Biden or Trump being the uh, president, f for me, for me, it's all the same. It's a choice. Do you want to get bit, bitten by the leopard or the cheetah? Do you want to get attacked by the lion or the hyena? That's how I look at it. And if someone comes mm -hmm. and says, but the vice president is an African-American woman, I say, yep. And the president before her, prior to Trump, was African-American. Mm. 
and he bombed more Muslims in the world than anyone in history, for kind of matter. But at the same time, I don't want to take that position and that opinion that we don't get involved in politics and things mm. like that. We get involved in a way that's religious and Islamic. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Yeah, I mean, representation is a whole other kettle of fish, you know. You, you can have a, a brown person or a black person or a whatever person, but are they representing that interest or are they just there to, as a token kind of gesture to, to perpetuate the, a system of white supremacy? And that's the nature of politics, mm. Dr. B. You know, the people who are proponents of the position, let's not get involved in politics. Let's just mm. do what the prophet did. So 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 and he's sincere in saying that. I believe that formula can work. Mm -hmm. And it has a point of view. Because now, too many examples can be given where a person says, look at Fulan and look at Alan. He became the mayor. Yeah. He became a senator. They became this, they became that. In America, two years ago, there were some freshmen senators and they were shaking things up. Somali lady, mm. another lady, she was um, Latino, and the Palestinian lady. They were shaking things up in the Senate talking about racism, mm -hmm. lack of equality, a lot of issues. They were very articulate, very strong. I was impressed with them. Mm -hmm. But the nature of politics is that you have to jump in bed with the pig. And you have to <laughs> wallow around in the mud with the pig. This is a reality. <laughs> so those same women, they had mm -hmm. to go and march for the LBGT parades and things mm -hmm. like that. So we just have to have a level, level of maturity and a level of understanding mm. just to know how to deal with these issues and a level of tolerance. Yeah. My coming here, I want to be tolerant. You have a platform while our youngsters listen. Does that mean you agree with everything I say? I agree? No. But we have to have a level of tolerance where we can work mm. and uh, communicate to help what's you know, in the best interest of our ummah. Mm. Speaking of uh, speaking of that, I mean, Birmingham has I don't know rightly or wrongly, it's always had a bit of a uh, re a, a, a reputation of being where you get the the kind of most um, uh, maybe zealous kind <laughs> of <laughs> you know uh, people of all the groups you know the 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 Barelvis, the Deobandis, the Salafis. Uh, uh, I don't know about HD, but all of these kind of, I don't know if it's something in the water in Birmingham or... <laughs> I don't know, brother, but I've yeah. noticed that as well. Do you, do you think it, things are changing? Are things getting uh, better? Do you think the unity is uh, among uh, camaraderie and the brotherhood? I don't believe so. Is? I think, unfortunately, I'm sad to say that Muslims are stuck on stupid as it relates to the unity issue. Mm. All we need to do, I believe, and I don't want to oversimplify this because I'll tell you, I am not going to unify and I'm not going to cooperate with someone who curses Aisha, Abu Bakr and Umar. Now, if there's an individual who doesn't know what he's saying and I sit down and talk to him and try to raise his level of consciousness and he insists on staying that way, then I'll cut him off. But hmm. the point is, there's a religious responsibility that we have as a community, as an Ummah, to learn the basics of our religion because there are things that allow us to be unified on, even with these non-Muslims here in Birmingham. Mm. The Madaris, the schools in Birmingham, did a pretty good job with letting these people know, no, we're not happy with our children being exposed to sex education at such an early age. And yeah. the Muslims cooperated with non-Muslims in that regard. Mm. In Babel Ola, even more so, we should be able to cooperate with our Muslim brothers. But again, I think just the Muslim community just has to come back to the source. And the source is we all have to understand Islam the correct way. And the correct way isn't to say everything that Abu Usama sees as being <laughs> correct, you have to do that. Correct no. way is my way. <laughs> yeah, no. We have to take our religion from the correct sources. Mm. Those books that we love, those imams that we love, and take Islam like that without adding into the religion what we can't find any proof for, the hocus pocus Islam, whatever it happens mm -hmm. to be. As for our cultures, stick to your cultures as long as they don't mm. conflict with the religion. So as a Pakistani brother, African-American, 
I will never see eye to eye with you just on the strength of we come from two diverse places. Mm. But the religion gives us one God, one Rasul, Salah, Salah, Salah. one Kitab, one Qibla, one Salah. And this is mm. where we get the correct understanding and application of unity. As for a slogan, mm. unity, unity. And this one over here believes he doesn't have to do any good deeds because Iman is in his heart. And that one's cursing the companions. And that one wants to kill you and me and my mm. mother and my father because he wants to stop the Khilafah. We're going to say, no, can't be united with no, this kind of Birmingham confusion. is more extreme than I thought. Brother, Birmingham <laughs> is extreme, brother. I will say that. I went to yeah. America a few years ago. I had a discussion. We had a roundtable discussion with some of the mm. Duat, and I just remained quiet. My brother Shadid Muhammad looked at me and said, Sheikh, mm. why are you so quiet? I said, because, man, I haven't been in America for 15 years or so. I don't What you guys are talking about, your kids are not in the masjid, that's not our reality in the U.K. In the U.K., we just prayed. Our kids are in the masjid. Mm. Our kids are going to lessons. Our kids are praying. Our kids are in the masjid. But we have this issue with the kids that are in the masjid feel disenfranchised and they want to take matters in their own hands and the government doesn't help to mm. quell that emotion that they have. Mm. So our kids are in the masjid, but we have to disarm them, cool them out, get them to understand what our religion is saying and that uh, now mm. is not the time to be anything other than prudent, mature, and in control of mm. our occult. So in terms of the, the different kind of masajid and the different um, schools of thought and, 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 and Muslim groups and jama'at, would you say the, the cooperation and, and unity between them is increasing, decreasing? I don't want to be pessimistic because mm. the Muslim uh, by nature should be optimistic, but I, don't also, I also don't want to be a liar because the Muslim mm. should be <laughs> truthful, especially to himself. Mm. And this bab of cooperation, I think many of the people who are teaching and the people who are practicing, students and the teachers, have a responsibility that we have created his beer mm. between ourselves. I uh, was contacted by someone, and I'm going to say this, uh, doctor, because you know I have love for you personally. I was telling someone I had a busy day today. I have to do this, this, that, that. I'm going to go to Syria. I have to do this, this, that. I mean, I'm going to go to Le yeah, Lebanon. Yeah, you should say Lebanon instead. I'm going to go to Lebanon <laughs> to help the refugees of Syria yeah. and so forth. So I have to do this, do that. And I have the brothers from 21st century. The brothers, oh, that, this, that, this, that, that. <laughs> I said, really? Well, to let you know, I met Dr. Butts before. You remember we did that program yeah, yeah, yeah. in uh, London? Yeah. by the bridge in that hotel. That was the first yeah. time that I met you. And I was explaining to the brother, you know, with that type of mentality that you have, it would prevent us from getting to know each other. Mm. The way it was with Humayun in Greenland. I didn't know him until I started chopping it up with him, sitting to talk to him, mm. as opposed to having preconceived notions. He's bro, he's Salafi, he's Jamaat al-Islami, he's yeah. Sufi, and automatically we just don't deal with each other. That's not our religion. So we have people who are teaching and people who are practicing. They are stoking the flames for Amen. this nonsense. And for our youngsters who don't have the experience, the knowledge, the courage to go against that current, a lot of Amen. times it gets swept up into the his beer. But as you get Amen. older, you start to think for yourself. You start to realize, Amen. man, I don't have to exist in this box that's been created for me. And that's not to say Dr. Salman that we're so liberal and free that we're just going to do anything and everything mm. according to our whims. No, we get knowledge of the religion and we cooperate with our brothers in the best way possible, man. Exactly. Cooperate mm. on al-bir and al-taqwa. Obeying Allah and righteousness. Simple. Mm. Do you think... So I still don't know. Do you, are you, is it getting worse? Is it getting better? Are you you're optimistic? Worse, I think it's worse. It's the why, same why is it worse. Getting, why is it getting worse? As Allah said in the Quran, Kullu hizbim bima ladayhim farihun. Every group is just happy with what it has. Happy with what it has. And no single group out there, I'm Salafi. Salafis as a group of people don't have all the answers. What happened with the brothers who were connected mm. to a Sheikh Haytham and Haddad, and you were one of those brothers, mm. where you brothers took the media to account for the defamation that they were saying. 
And because he had a team of professionals around him in different professional fields, mm. we were able. I said we. I wasn't there. We, we were able to win. Mm. I told some du'at at that time who wanted to refute a Sheikh Haytham al-Haddad. If he deserves to be refuted, I say refute with adab, with respect, with knowledge, with justice. That's our religion. I'm not saying mm. anyone is beyond being refuted, but look at all the issues. The point here is when he won, we won. It makes the government, it makes the newspaper, the media realize if you do this again, this may happen to you again. Mm. So as you get mature, you're able to see that and appreciate that. When you're young, you listen to what I'm saying right now, and all you understand is, I'm watering down the dawa. I'm watering down the dawa. Well, <laughs> you stay in the corner with that understanding because you're free to do that. But we have to do work out here. Hmm. And in doing the work out here, we're going to come across people who are not thinking the same that way that we're thinking, whether they're Muslims or non-Muslims. Hmm. So I don't say bend the rules. I say, be like the Prophet was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Verily, you have in the message of Allah a mm. perfect example. And what did he do, doctor? He went to al Medina and he coexisted with Ahlul Kitab, Jews and Christians and Mushrikeen from all of those tribes. Mm. And he went into agreements with them. When they wanted him to compromise the religion, he told them, Lakum dina kum deen. But he had no problem with realizing it, realizing he's not an island unto himself. So when I got my last job in Liverpool, they said, what's going to be the first thing you're going to do as the imam when you come here? I said, the first thing I'm going to do, inshallah, is follow the sunnah. And that is, try to find out who's who in the community so that I can mm -hmm. build alliances. Alliances within the masjid. And outside of the message, so I can know what I'm dealing with and mm -hmm. make everybody feel a part of the process of moving forward. And that's one of my messages to the young mm -hmm. brothers, man. You are not an island unto yourself. You're going to need, if you're living in the Badia, in the desert, you're going to need the people living in the city. And the people in the city need the people in the desert. We need each other. As for this mentality, it's just me, myself, and I, and my group, yeah. and I'm just singing to the choir. That's not my understanding of a dawah. And subhanAllah, that is where, that, I think that's how you, what we differentiate imams, like, yani historically leaders of the ummah, they were able to have this broad kind of uh, impact. If you look at uh, people that are called imams, they weren't just like uh, academics, you might say, in, in here and there. There were people that are respected by different backgrounds. There were people who worked alongside uh, Sheikh Islam Rahimahullah Ibn Taymiyyah for example he's, 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 uh, he's, he's been weaponized by some people who want to use decontextualized bits and refute other people here and there but he united with the, the people he used to refute their ideology and their aqidah when it was against for example the you know Tatar invasions the, uh, for, for the sake of the, the maslaha of the ummah as a whole and it uh, requires this big thinking, this macro level thinking. I smiled when you said his, his name, Ibn Taymiyyah, Rahmatullah, because that was the person who came to my mind. Mm. He was refuting everybody. <laughs> Every and anybody who went against the principles of the Kitab and the Sunnah, he was mm. refuting them. And he was refuting them comparable to how far they were away or close they were or yeah. whether the person was an imam of the kufr and innovation. We have some brothers when our Sheikh Ali al-Halabi had died. Mm. These brothers, some of them, the sickness brother, they were saying the people of the Sunnah, alhamdulillah, he died. Arahallah, mm. al-Balad, mm. al-Bilad al-Ibad. Because the Salaf used to deal like this with Al Muhasibi and Ibn Abi Duab. What? First of all, he's not even guilty of what the kufr that you're saying he's guilty of. And secondly, why are you making qiyas with Al Muhasibi and another Muslim? I know a brother who his grandmother was a Brawi. She was in her 80s. She died. And he told me, I made dua for him. I said, You going to the wedding, to the funeral? He said, No, she was a Brawi. I said, man, are you a crackhead or something? I don't want to put crackheads down. <laughs> but I said, man, are you a freaking crackhead? That's the mother who gave birth to you, brother. Gave birth to you. 
It's saying, ah, ahl al bid'ah. So what can you do with an understanding, a person who understands like that? I hope, as time has gone on, mm. that that brother has calmed down off of that. But uh, I think don't our imams and our khutaba have some share in the responsibility in that? Because they might take things like, for example, Sheikh Islam was written in an academic setting, talking about theology, and they're broadcasting these things in a decontextualized way, uh, way on the mimbar. Is that how Sheikh Islam spoke on the mimbar? You know, refuting specific points of aqidah, or was the mimbar for broad general messages that the ummah needs? This comes with knowledge, sincerity, and experience, inshallah. When people look at him, Mm. And they uh, judge him and his efforts in its totality. You come away again with a person who's not ma'asum. He's not the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But he was in an institution, brother. And like mm. you said, he knew how to deal with everybody. And then, as you know, some of his ardent enemies would die. Mm. And he would put himself forward to take care of the family of the deceased. Mm. So where's the application of... Abu Samu's rough and tough and Ibn Taymiyyah said this and there out of context. Mm. It's not the right, you know, I, I deconstructed what he really meant and I'm rough and tough using it out of context and I choose to disregard all of those examples. His hal, his gentleness, his softness, his kindness. Mm. And that's what our prophet was upon. So, no, no, no. so just to bring it back to the square real quick, Dr. Salman, I think um, it's the same or worse. People are calling to themselves and they're calling to their madhabs and they're calling to their masjids and they're calling to uh, their imams mm. when we should be calling to Allah. Ud'u ila sabili rabbika. Call to the way of your Lord. And I hope we uh, see the importance and the need to do this. Inshallah. What are you going to do to fix that problem? I'm going to try to continue, inshallah, to give a message to the community of the importance of being balanced as we approach Islam. And the only Islam that Allah is going to accept from mm. you and me, your mother, my mother, father, your children, my children, people in Green Lane and London, is the Islam that is similar to what Abu Bakr and Uthman and Ali, may Allah be pleased with them, were doing. If they were not mm. doing it, it's not the religion. As Al Imam Malik said, what's the religion for them? Religion for us. What corrected them is going to correct us. Does that mean we're not going to have ikhtilaf? We're not going to? No, ikhtilaf is there. But their way showed us how to have ikhtilaf. Their way mm -hmm. showed us what ikhtilaf is permissible in and what it's not permissible mm -hmm. in. So for me, I want to continue to give a message to balanced Islam and be a person who believes what I say is correct. What I believe is correct. But it could be wrong. Mm. And if you can show me my mistakes, I'll retract, throw it away, and keep moving forward. So that's what I'm going to do to try to do my part, inshallah. Stay true and sincere and authentic to the message. Because as I said, I'm against extremism. I'm against radicalism. I'm against this hezbiyah. But I'm also mm. against oppression that we receive from non-Muslims as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My only enemy that I talk about, the only people I have problems with are the Muslims. He's a deviant. <laughs> he's a hisbi. He's a... And when one of them comes, the prime minister of the United States of America, the president comes and says, Ramadan Mubarak. And then I come and say, Mashallah. <laughs> Mashallah. He said, Inshallah. He said, Inshallah. Because <laughs> it's going to happen every year. Biden mm. said, inshallah, and Muslims were about to make him the mu'adhan in Mecca. <laughs> no, we're going to call that out. Mm. We're not going to call it out because we're against the man because of his color. Mm. We're going to call that out because there's a problem religiously with your mm. understanding of wala wa bara. We advise the Muslims. We make amr ma'roof and nahyan munkar with the Muslims. We do all of that. But we skipped sometimes the wala ba part. <laughs> yeah, it's a problem. <laughs> So we just have to be yeah. balanced, uh, brother, uh, Zak doctor. Lakha. Zak lakha, I'm really uh, concerned with the, the time. I know we've taken a lot of your time. And I do want to continue this discussion maybe in, on a future date. So if you, if you don't mind, we'll be, uh, depending on how nice the lunch is, 
Well, uh, maybe we'll be coming back someday, inshallah. So, Zakum khairan for your time. And Zakum khairan for you uh, watching at home. Uh, if you like this podcast, give a like and a share. Get us uh, get involved in the comments below. Let us know what you think. If you agree, disagree with anything. If you want to refute the sheikh, if you want to refute me, which is probably more likely, uh, but do it with like all the, all the things he said, adab, knowledge, etc., etc. Um, yeah. So remember to subscribe, hit the bell notification, get all the uh, notifications when you up upload anything new. And that's it from uh, myself and the Islam Tunian C team. Zakum khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, uh, script.